It's actually the first of four hours all together today and tomorrow morning. And um, given that this is quite a diverse audience, um, I had a look, look at the posters right now um, and saw that sort of like there's a few people in the audience who probably know most of the stuff I will be talking about. Others probably know very little. So as I more or less anticipated that, I split up my presentation into two parts, um, which will then sort of like merge into each other. The first part will be a relatively basic introduction into the field, but where I want to go into some details, I know that Miles um, has been presenting you with some of the stuff already at the beginning of this week. A um, couple of weeks ago, we thought we might be able to sort out sort of like who does what, but ultimately we decided it would be too much work um, to get that done. And that anyways, given for most people this being new stuff, a little bit of repetition doesn't hurt and two different perspectives uh, on the material. So I presume you have heard a little bit, but in some sense, if you are not there, it would also be fine. Um, then the second part of the presentation will be actual research work, which is partially not even published yet, so that you get an idea of what is currently being done with this kind of methodology. As it is a relatively a sort of like complicated method in some sense, um, uh, I will probably jump forth and back a little bit like John Chalker did it between the blackboard and the screen and do sort of like the simple things or kind of mainstream results on the, uh, on the screen and then from time to time to do a few calculations by hand. Okay, so um, what is the entire thing about? So here the question is, what is the fundamental problem of solid state physics? Because the methods we are talk will be talking about in this context, the most famous one, DMRG, and also variants of it, the question is actually, what is it good for? Because it's not all problems in many body quantum systems that you can successfully address with this kind of methodology, or at least not now. People are working on trying to extend this, and it remains to be seen uh, where we will get. And I think all of you, certainly, otherwise you wouldn't be here, have seen a Hamiltonian like I wrote it down um, here, um, which is just kind of a solid, which ha doesn't even have a vibrating lattice. It just has um, um, electrons uh, which move around, which attract, uh, which repel each other, and then they move in an effective potential uh, presented by the lattice. We don't even have phonons in this model. But even this problem has been keeping us busy for the last almost, yeah, almost 90 years by now. Um, and the problem of that is uh, to solve the electron-electron interaction. Actually, some people at this point talk about the Dirac challenge because Dirac about 90 years ago wrote that basically all these problems of solid state physics having this Hamiltonian and the Schrodinger equation have been reduced to computation. And so, so in some sense they have been uh, solved, but he was uh, smart enough to realize that in fact uh, uh, this might still make them extremely difficult and we are still struggling. And so uh, to position the methods I will be talking about, um, I break down all of solid state physics in two very simple uh, pictures. The one is the case where you have say a lattice potential here in green on the left um, and the, ele the valence electrons, we don't worry about the core electrons, are all relatively well delocalized, so they are smeared out like a soup um, of electrons, which means the interactions are relatively well screened. And this is the picture you all are extremely familiar with, kind of the band picture of essentially non-interacting electrons, where, for example, you would say if the top band which cont contains electrons is half filled, then that would be a great conductor. If it were totally filled, it would be an insulator. And you know that for many metal semiconductors, this is a wonderful picture. And in this context, methods like density functional theory are working extremely well. So we are not concerned with this type 
of problems. We are rather con uh, concerned with the second type of problem where the valence electrons are tightly bound. We will see in which situations that might pop up or also in kind of simulations of that situation, which means they have very strong local interactions. So if you have an electron here, and it wants to hop to the next lattice site, it will basically very strongly feel that there's a well-localized electron on that second uh, lattice site. And so what you have to do is um, that you really have to take into account the full picture of the motion of all the electrons, because what they do will be strongly correlated um, among itself. And I guess most of you here are working in that field anyways. So just to give you an example, if you take the high TC parent compounds, uh, they would have a band structure picture or a, a density of state picture rather, which looks like that. These are half filled parent compounds and you would say, oh, conductor. But in fact, these are extremely good insulators. So this, these systems are very difficult to describe. And so there are sort of like there's one approach that has been very successful in the last decades is that you form model Hamiltonians, which are an extremely simplified cartoon version of what, what you are doing. Like the last lecture you heard this morning, this were also kind of cartoon models of the kind of really very complicated physics, which however you expect bring out what really matters. And in this kind of methods, in this kind of Hamiltonians where the methods I will be explaining today and tomorrow will work, what I will show tomorrow, and this is why I brought in this slide, despite the fact that you probably all know that, that there is currently a trend in kind of material science oriented um, aspects of condensed matter physics to bring, to try to solve the co correlation problem in a more realistic context. And one of the ways of doing this is the so-called dynamical mean field theory combined with density functional theor theory. We will hear about that uh, tomorrow, hopefully. Um, and, and there also this kind of methodology might be extremely helpful uh, to make these methods work well. So then we are away from the model Hamiltonians, but that's a current trend. So mainly we are still concerned with model Hamiltonians. Okay, you have that in many uh, different situations, like in zero dimensions would be impurity physics, quantum dots, in one dimension spin chains and ladder ladders like Herbert Spohn this afternoon will be talking about that. Then we heard about frustrated magnets um, uh, before and what I will be talking about tomorrow is then the realistic modeling um, of transition metals and rare earth compounds where methods like the one I'm explaining today are also potentially relevant. My examples today and my way of thinking will however be mainly focused on one dimensional systems. You will see that in a second. Um, okay, we can't jump that for the moment. And another way of looking at all that, which basically serves me as a motivation why non-equilibrium physics is so important is that as you, I think you all know, I mean, this has been ongoing business for 20 years now almost, um, that you can form Bose-Einstein condensates with ultra-cold bosonic atoms. They are extremely weakly interacting, but you can make them strongly interacting and then you are back into sort of like the picture we are looking at um, uh, today. And there's various ways of making them strongly interacting. One of them is, is there someone having problem or is this coming from the outside, uh, is that you use opt so-called optical lattices. The pioneering experiment was actually done back home, sort of like at my place in the group of Emanuel Bloch, um, where they used optical lattices to basically reproduce the Hubbard model for bosons. I mean, you have, I'm sure you have all seen the Hubbard model many, many times. Why, but here it comes about in an almost perfect realization you have an on-site repulsion of the, of the atoms. They can hop from one lattice site to the next with the usual amplitude T. Um, the fun thing is you can tune the interaction by making the lattice 
more or less steep. In fact, this is a sloppy way of speaking. The interaction hardly depends on the lattice depth, but what you do is you can exponentially suppress the kinetic energy. And so relative to that, because it's always the, the, the ratio that matters, of course, the whole thing um, becomes very weakly or strongly interacting. You can also do that with uh, fermions. And the whole thing that is nice about that is that as you can tune this ratio of interaction and um, uh, kinetic energy, you can do all sorts of non-equilibrium things. You can stay very close to equilibrium, then you have a, like by an adiabatic change of this ratio, then you can actually achieve a quantum phase transition or um, this is the famous pictures from this 2002 experiment where they started out with a superfluid which is shown by a peak, this is in momentum space, at k equals zero. Then if you make the lattice stronger, you see Bragg peaks. Well, it's not exactly Bragg peaks, but that's a detail. And then you make it stronger, 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 and then you get into the mod insulating phase because they re the electrons repel each other, or the atoms. You see, I'm, th I'm saying electrons, but in reality, these are bosons simulating the behavior of the electrons. They become so strongly repulsive that they basically block each other. You get into a mod insulator, correlations become short-ranged, and the picture in momentum space becomes diffuse. What you also can do is you can, however, make this, this is closer to what I will be talking about today, and you can make this change very suddenly, and again, this is the first experiment ever done in that direction, and what you then had is you went from this superfluid, you made the interaction strong, so you would get into a mod insulator, but because it was a sudden change, what happens is you change the entire um, energy level, so the phases of the different parts of the wave function um, evolve differently, and then you get a, a dephasing and rephasing of the phases, and you come back to the original uh, wave function. So there's a movie actually from the experiment. And what, we, what the question I want to ask is, uh, can, we, can we simulate, can we calculate numerically the ground states? or finite temperature states of such systems? We will answer both these questions with yes. And also, in view of um, such experiments, can we also look at far from equilibrium um, dynamics? And the answer will also be within certain limitations, yes. Um, and there will be more limitations, which of course I will not sell right in the beginning. So um, this is what I will be uh, talking about. Um, in fact, um, the non-equilibrium stuff was really started by this field because in solids, most of the experiments in non-equilibrium were actually quite close to equilibrium in the past linear response, which of course you can also treat by these methods. Um, and also quantum mechanical decoherence in a typical solid is so strong that in some sense you wonder whether you need a technique that follows your wave function in all details because this is what um, uh, ne tensor networks, matrix product states actually do. So, um, imagine I would be, I were able to give you the full wave function um, of a system of say 10 to the 23 particles. Would this be of any use to you? No, it would not because I mean, uh, what can you do with this? I print it out and staple it in here, a big pile in this room, but what you really are interested in, what is the pressure, what is the temperature, what is the susceptibility, what is the order parameter, where sits the phase transition, you are interested in such questions and answers. So, um, as you all know, the problem in quantum physics, and um, the entire presentation will be entirely um, concerned with uh, quantum physics. I mentioned that because uh, from what I got this morning, uh, John Chalker had been presenting also classical results. Here it's only quantum. And so what you have is the usual problems that say for a spin one half way of spin up down, um, the number of degrees of freedom in the thermodynamic limit is even exponentially large. So this idea of piling up a printed out wave function in this room wouldn't work anyways. Okay, so what can we do? And this is in some sense, now the question, what do you do in an exponentially diverging Hilbert space? And one way is, because we don't have the quantum computer, we have to do it with a classical computer. Uh, one way is doing exact diagonalizations. 
uh, where you really diagonalize the Hamiltonian matrix. In reality, what it means is you de determine um, some extreme eigenstates. A full diagonalization is not usually meant by that. And even if you are only interested in the extreme spins, uh, extreme eigenstates, in terms of spins and electrons, you are quite limited. These numbers are approximate because depending on the amount of symmetries you might exploit in lattice structure, it might actually be larger. I think for, for spins, the largest stuff I have seen is by Andreas Leuchli in Innsbruck, 56 spins or something. And he, this guy is really the, the crazy guy for ED. Um, but you see, it doesn't really make a big difference. And nevertheless, this method is extremely valuable because what you learn from there, you can really rely on. All the other methods have their methodological bias, which may land you in the soup. Um, this one doesn't, but of course, you are far from the thermodynamic limit. What you can also do is, of course, the stochastic sampling of state space. This is another answer we have to huge problems. And what you get there is, all the zoo of quantum Monte Carlo techniques. Can anyone tell me Werner Kraut who spoke, if you still remember, two and a half weeks ago at the beginning of this seminar? Did he cover only classical or also quantum? Uh, classical. OK. Because Werner has been doing both in his life, so it seems he focused on classical. You can also apply this to quantum systems. This, of course, not now my, not now my lecture to do that. But let me mention that there is something called the negative sign problem, which pops up for fermionic systems, not all of them, but unfortunately many of the interesting ones, um, and for frustrated spin systems. Um, where basically the interpretation of weights as probabilities becomes a problem because of negative signs popping up. You can get rid of that, but then the statistics um, of the simulation becomes uh, very bad. I should mention here, because that could be very interesting for some of you, there's currently um, a huge effort of development going on in that field, something called Diagrammatic Monte Carlo, mainly driven, I think, by Nikolai Prokofiev, Boris Swissonov in Amherst, Massachusetts, also by my colleague Lode Pollitt in Munich, some people in Paris, where in some situations it's now much better with the sign problem. So that might be a problem for people like me in that field who live off the fact that they can't do that. Yeah? Um, it's, um, so that could be potentially interesting because for them this negative sign problem turns into an advantage. Okay, wait, wait and see. Watch out for that. That could be one of the big interesting methods in the future, this diagrammatic Monte Carlo. So what I will be talking about to, uh, today and tomorrow is a different approach, which is that you say, well, I try to concentrate myself on a small aspect of Hilbert space, and somehow the choice which part I look at should be physically motivated. And so I have to decimate it. In many ways, this is also what you had in the last lecture, where um, you were presented with setting up variational wave functions. I mean, even if variational wave functions may not form a linear space, maybe they do, maybe they don't, they are, of course, a subset of the state space. Simply by their form, you constrain yourself. That's one way of doing a selection of a subspace, a very successful method in physics. Um, RG methods are another way of doing that. This integrating out of fast degrees of freedom in an RG step is exactly doing um, a selection of a subspace. This is actually where the word decimation is mainly used. Um, the question, of course, is how do we find the good selection? And I claim that matrix product states as kind of the most simple incarnation of tensor network states are um, uh, a very systematic way um, of doing that. So the whole business, actually, now I will give you an ahistoric presentation um, in this uh, in this lecture, I will present it to you in the language we would use right now, but it is to some extent also interesting to appreciate the importance of notation in that field. Perhaps I do that because notation will be a little bit unpleasant and unusual perhaps at first for you, but I want to, uh, to kind of motivate you to make the effort to try and understand it. Because in some sense, 
all this has an extremely long prehistory which goes back into the 40s and then stuff was forgotten. But the, the modern history of all this kind of um, network states starts with something which is called something totally different, the famous DMRG, the Density Matrix Renormalization Group invented by White in 92. And this um, method started out with ex solving exactly one problem and Steve managed to get that past the reviewers of uh, PRL after one example. Uh, this new, new formulation appears extremely powerful and versatile and we believe it will become the leading numerical method for 1D systems and eventually will become useful for higher dimensions as well. I mean, this is an extremely strong claim, but it must be said that actually it has come true and this is what I will be presenting to you. Um, on the other hand, progress and in, this, in the methodological development was relatively slow. And I remember that from the days when I was um, your age. And then sort of like what happened that in 2004, um, an insight that DMRG is linked to something called matrix product states, a formalism which goes back, as I said, to the 40s. There's this book by Baxter exactly solved models in statistical mechanics. Many of you perhaps know that, but in some sense, it's all in that book already. It's just that they didn't have the computers at that time. Um, but sort of like that, there is a link that it's more or less the same. That had been around for quite some time and we all thought it's something mathematically nice, but okay, nice for the mathematicians. We go on doing it like we always do it with RG and whatever. And then in 2004 or so, suddenly this insight exploded. And you see this from the enormous number of papers that appeared um, within uh, one year, where a major part of the methods that are now currently the mainstream in the business were, were pioneered or invented. It's just because this new language, which I will introduce you to, is so much more powerful for thinking about it. Some algorithms which had been extremely difficult to invent before suddenly became extremely easy. Basically, the formalism more or less forced them on you. You will see stuff which you will say, well, if I look at it, is there any other way of doing it? And I would say, no, there isn't. But in, in, in other formalisms, you didn't see that. So this is why we will uh, go um, through that. And this is the point for the advertising, the uh, publicity interruption. Um, if you want to read some reviews, um, there is an old RevMod FIS, which was still in this old statistical physics perspective. Um, if you want to write your own code, many people find this review um, um, useful. And then there's one which takes more a quantum information perspective. There have been many more reviews since, but as the field has been exploding so much, um, there you would really have to look more precisely uh, what you're looking for in detail. Um, so now let's get started after kind of trying to uh, uh, introduce you to this idea that we have to go through a heavy formalism. Perhaps it's not so heavy after all. Um, let's uh, start out with the definitions. First of all, I imagine a quantum system that lives on L lattice sites. At the moment, there is no need to think about that as a one-dimensional system, but you may if you wish, because this is where this will be most useful anyways. On each lattice site I, I introduce local states which I will co con consistently call sigma I, and there will be lower, lowercase d of them. So for a spin one half, lowercase d would be just two spin up, spin down. Then the local Hilbert space is formed by these local states sigma I, one to d, and the total Hilbert space is of course simply the tensor. And then the most general state you can write down is, of course, I mean, I'm talking about pure states. We will cover mixed states at some point. Um, the most uh, general state you can write down is, of course, the superposition of, exponentially, of the exponentially many basis states with some uh, expansion coefficients. You all know that. And we will perhaps abbreviate them from time to time in this kind of uh, notation. Okay, so far so good. In that sense, you can discuss any 
problem uh, of quantum physics, but of course we have this exponential um, complexity. So what do we do about that? And one standard approximation you all know, here you will encounter it in a perhaps somewhat unfamiliar phase, um, is um, the mean field approximation, that you basically assume that each particle is exposed um, to, say, external fields and to effective fields, if you think about Weiss mean field theory, produced by all the other particles that are around, which means that effectively the wave function of these many particles will factorize. That means that, uh, uh, site per site, that means that this very complicated C sigma 1 to sigma L, so exponentially many coefficients, they get down to factors, one factor on the first side, one factor on the second side, and so on and so forth. And of course the value that the factor has uh, will depend on the local state that act is on site one, two, three, and so on and so forth. So instead of d to the power l coefficients, you get down to d times l coefficients. We all know that mean field theory is extremely powerful and efficient. Someone once told me you get a Nobel Prize for mean field theory, not for the fifth order perturbative correction. Okay, that's probably true. Um, but the big problem about mean field theory is that it misses perhaps in some sense the ex ex essential quantum feature, namely entanglement. Um, in a kind of a, in parenthesis, there's many people talking about something like quantum physics 2.0 uh, and then you wonder what was quantum physics 1.0 um, in technological applications. We all know, of course, our, the computers, well, the laptop, um, your smartphone. These are all sort of like quantum physics 1.0 devices. They use basically the Pauli principle and wave mechanics. Um, entanglement as a sort of like a, a, as a resource is not yet used much. I mean, there's now quantum cryptography, a quantum computer would use it, but that's sort of like on, on, on the way of becoming um, important. And a mean field ansatz totally cannot capture that. And the simplest case is, for example, if you take two spin one halves, then this would be the most general wave function you can write down. And yeah, now you try to, and now you say, I want to encode the singlet state, which is obviously a very important state, um, where what happens on side two is totally conditioned by what, by what happens on side one, so they are entangled. And if you now try to bring that into this form, that of course is easy, you just read off the C's, and then you say, can I factor the C the C coefficients in this way, like I um, wrote it here. I will not show this, try it for yourself, maybe you have already in, at some other lecture, you simply can't. And the, so there is no way, there is no way of, and, and we will see this in a more mathematical form, there is no way of capturing entanglement in a mean field approximation or in such a product, factor, such a factorization. But what you can think about is, and this is how I want to motivate this type of state, is you can say, well, let's do the simple, a, a generalization of this product of scalars to a product of matrices. That's, a simple, that's something very simple. So the product would be, the, the original product would be a product of one times one matrices. So here we are going to two times two matrices, say as the most primitive extension or something much, much larger, as large as your computer will be able to handle. At the boundaries you have to do something because you need a scalar ultimately, but let's not worry about that um, at the moment. So is this potentially a good answer, so this is just um, bullshit. So, um, the answer is, this is an extremely useful ansatz, and in fact, it had already been used a lot in the late 80s and early 90s in the context of the so-called Affleck-Kennedy-Leap-Tasaki model, 
which I will not discuss here, but it's, it's actually a model which is a very simple representation of also topological states. At that time, it went under the heading of the Haldane model and the Haldane gap or the Haldane spin gap. Um, and there it turns out that just going to these two times two dimensional matrices as the most simple generalization of the mean field ansatz is able to capture basically everything that matters in this model. Yeah, and present actually exact solution in, in, in some sense. But this is sort of like not what I'm aiming at. There's an entire field of research where you study this kind of ansatz analytically with small dimensional matrices and work out everything by hand. Um, what I'm aiming at is say, what can you do for whatever Hamiltonian, but allowing yourself to make these matrices as big as your computer can handle. And then you arrive at the general matrix product state, which will be the topic for the next half hour until you get lunch, uh, where you say, um, for, for the, 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 this is still this coefficient C sigma one to sigma L, but it's now constrained to have the form that, is the, that it is the product of matrices where on each lattice side, of course, there are various matrices depending on what the local state is, like I had the numbers before. And so that I can work out that to be one of these scalar coefficients, um, the matrix dimensions, of course, have to match. Yeah. So I start out with actually a, a row vector and end with a column vector. Um, and in between, I have real matrices. What I should mention right here, because we will make extensive use of that, it looks like a technical remark, but in some sense, it's what makes these algorithms ultimately work. And if this possibility does not exist, you are in trouble, is this representation of a quantum state is not, ex not unique. Because you can just take any matrix X, which is invertible, and then insert it here, like X, X minus one in here. And then you redefine the one matrix as MX, and the other one is x minus one m, and of course the state has not changed. We will use that a lot in the following. And I think now comes the, uh, um, no, not yet. I still prepare you for the one really bad slide. And um, the question is why would you want to make um, this ansatz? I just mentioned to you that there's this AKLT model where it seems to work, but then this is relatively special. I claim, and we will work out that on the blackboard because it's useful, um, even if in practice you don't do that, it's numerically inefficient. Uh, you can show that any quantum state can be brought into that form. It may not just not be useful, but sort of like that's of course important. They say in principle I can write any state like that. Um, that what is more important in practice is these states are hierarchical. Um, the size of the matrix you need to get a good representation, good approximate representation of a quantum state will be related to the degree of entanglement you have. So right now you should understand that all these methods I will be presenting today and tomorrow have the bias that they love low entanglement. So if you're in a situation of extremely strong entanglement, and we will see that such cases, do not expect these methods to work. That's a clear bias. And a second remark is, we will not pursue, I will show one slide, is that funnily enough, they emerge naturally also in traditional renormalization groups. And this is with hindsight, the connection between MPS, RG, and DMRG. What is extremely important, and in some sense what I will be talking about today, is you can manipulate them very easily and efficiently. Otherwise, it would be useless. Why would you come up with this complicated representation otherwise? And perhaps the best thing is um, if you have a, a bunch of these matrix product states, you parameterize them by these matrices, um, you, you can search them efficiently because typically what you will have is not the situation is I give you the state and do something with it, but what you will typically have is I have a physical problem, meaning I have a Hamiltonian H, and then I want to know what state represents the ground state. 
yeah, I mean, what matrix product state is, is the best approximation to the ground state? What matrix product state is the best, best approximation to a mixed finite temperature state? At first sight, this may seem impossible, but it is. So these are questions you want to ask, and actually we will provide efficient algorithms for that. Okay, so the one mathematical tool you basically need to understand is the so-called singular value decomposition. And if you allow me for one second to ask you who in his, his or her undergraduate training um, was exposed to singular value decompositions? Raise your hand. Okay, the numbers are small, but they are increasing. When I was a student, you were not taught that stuff at all. Engineers have been taught that since, I don't know, the last hundred years or so, because they use it every day. Google, basically, the Google empire is in some sense based on singular value decompositions. Um, we, it seems in physics, we are so much focused on the eigenvalue decomposition that um, we do not know about this. But this is the workhorse. This method we should understand. And actually, those of you who say, oh my God, I am in mean, this entire stuff here um, about DMRG, matrix products, say, so on, doesn't interest me. If you want to take one thing home which might be useful in your future, uh, it's really the singular value decomposition. It's perhaps, in my view, I would say the most interesting and most powerful decomposition linear algebra has on offer. Yeah, and many of the other techniques you can derive from it, actually. So what you take is you take a general matrix um, of A of dimension M times N, and there is, I, I, I call K the smaller of the two dimensions, whichever it is, and then the claim is I can decompose this matrix A in the form US V dagger. And the three matrices U, S, and V dagger have very special properties. That's, of course, why you want to do this. Um, the dimensions are such that the product sort of like matches up to M times N. That has to be. And the claim is U has the property that U dagger U is the identity. Or in other words, the columns of this U matrix are all orthonormal. If it happens that the U matrix is square, then it's actually unitary. The V dagger matrix, the same thing. There it's in fact that the rows of V are orthonormal, so that the, the columns of V dagger are orthonormal, um, and it's unitary if that is a square matrix. So that's already very nice because orthonormal vectors, you start thinking about bases. And in between, you have the matrix S. It's a diagonal matrix. It has only non-negative entries. Um, they can be zero, of course, but they are not negative. And these are the so-called singular values. And for example, the number of those guys that do not vanish immediately give you the rank of the matrix A. This is not what we will mainly use, but so this is where it ties back to standard uh, linear algebra. So, and a notation which you will find a lot in the literature, maybe I will also use it uh, today on the blackboard whenever we will see, is that, for example, the, 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 these orthonormal columns, you write them as vectors, say like as ket vectors, u1, u2, and so together they form the matrix u. You do that because you want, you call them singular values, uh, singular vectors, these are the left singular vectors because they sit on the left. You can do the same thing for the V. Um, you do that because <coughs> ultimately you will use them to build orthonormal bases. So that's a popular notation. Good. So you can do this decomposition. Why should it be useful? Well, let's first compare it to the one which you definitely know, all of you, is the eigenvalue decomposition of a matrix A where basically the, here the vectors in U are now the eigenvectors, and then of course lambda is diagonal and contains as diagonal entries um, uh, the eigenvalues lambda i. And you can connect these two if you square A. Well, A is not necessarily a square matrix, so what you do is you look at A dagger A or A A dagger, and if you work all that out, 
do the singular value decomposition, what you ultimately find is that the, that the, the, that the matrix A has a singular value decomposition such that the squares of the singular values are the eigenvalues um, of, um, of A. So this is the connection. The same thing happens for A dagger A. What changes is the eigenvectors. The eigenvectors of A, A dagger are these left singular vectors. The eigenvectors of A dagger A are the right singular vectors. But we don't need that detail. But you see, in some sense, there is a close connection the reason why in that case, just for those of you who do numerics, um, why you don't use the singular value decomposition but go for the eigenvalue decomposition is because squaring a matrix is numerically always bad because it uh, makes the condition number worse. And in fact, the algorithms we have nowadays for, do sing for doing singular value decompositions are not as efficient as the best ones we have for eigenvalue decomposition. So by all means, if you want eigenvalues, do it in that way. But more generally, you will have to turn to singular values. OK, so now this is the most complicated slide of the entire presentation. And here I will go to the blackboard and leave this. Um, leave this, well, let me take this along perhaps and leave this uh, on the screen. And I will use now the singular value decomposition step by step to show you that you can decompose any state into a matrix product state. So what do, what do we do? We take these exponentially many coefficients, sigma 1 to sigma L. Now, I, 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 under, I think of these coefficients as a matrix. I call this matrix, what did I call it here, psi. Now, this starts well. Psi. Um, and I do an operation that those of you that are good at MATLAB and Python, they know this under reshaping. Yeah, you can interpret this as one really huge vector where this, is, this entire thing here forms the index of the entry of the vector. But I can also kind of say this is the vector. I can say this is the first line of a matrix, this is the second line of a matrix, and so on and so forth. So I can turn this into an object which looks like this. And this is what I call reshaping. Actually, these uh, languages actually have commands to do that. So I call this sigma 1, comma, sigma 2 to sigma L. So this is now a matrix. This is why I insist on the comma. On this matrix, you can, of course, now apply your singular value decomposition. That's the matrix A I had. But I need A, unfortunately, for something else now to stay with standard MPS notation. And then what I have is I have this matrix U. Then I have S. Then I have this matrix V dagger. And now let's think about the indices. Um, the matrix U will start with the sig index sigma 1. The matrix V dagger will end with all this rest, sigma 2 to sigma L. And now, because they guys, these guys are multiplied to each other, I will, in principle, have a double sum. But as S is diagonal, it's a single sum. So let me call that sum, what was it here, A1. So I have here, OK. So that's, that's my first step. So and what I do next is, is um, I do another operation, which is very important. Namely, I do something which is called slicing. All this stuff one is doing in this field is more or less reshaping, SVD, and slicing. If you understand those operations, you are basically in business. So what I do is, is let's take the following picture. Um, this, is, um, this, is a matrix, um, this is a matrix I have, where sort of like these guys, if I do a matrix multiplication, will be multiplied to what's happening further on in my, um, in my sort of like um, matrix ansatz. So what I can do is I can slice this 
into a bunch of matrices, which are now kind of these rectangular stripes. And this is sort of like matrix one, matrix two, matrix three, matrix four, and so on. Let's give it D right away, because this is related to this D, the local state dimension. So and I, now I do this here to this matrix and say I do the following slicing. U sigma one, and let me introduce an artificial dummy index one here. I can do that. I mean, this doesn't do anything. A1, I write this as a set of matrices, namely these guys here, which I call A sigma one. That's then basically the value of sigma one, one, two, three, and up to D. And these matrices have then dimension one comma A1. So that's basically what's going on here. Um, on here and you see what you get in this special case we will see from step two onwards um, uh, we, we won't have a dummy index anymore but a real one what you see here is a bunch of row vectors and as we may remember that I told you the first matrix in a matrix product state has to be a row vector otherwise I don't get a scalar ultimately so is this step this slicing that where I had one matrix, I now have a bunch of D of them. Um, is this step understood? Ask me again, it's this, this is the one step which I think from teaching this uh, several times, which I always find with hindsight, that's where most people stumble. It's in some sense very simple, but usually you haven't seen something like this before. Sorry? I will, I will make the second step, um, um, sorry. Ah, okay. What you do is, or perhaps what I do is, I will do the, the, the next step where the slicing appears again. <coughs> and explain it again there because the first slicing is a little bit special. So hold out for a second and then we will, uh, we, will, um, we will do that. So what I can do now is I rearrange, I rearrange this result as I have my sum over A1. Now this guy is now written as A sigma 1, 1 comma A1. And this entire stuff here, I multiply together and then I have this in this A1 to sigma 2. And I can, if I want, call this CA1 sigma 2 to sigma L. Okay. And now what I do is, don't worry, we will not fill, fill the entire blackboard, is I do this reshaping again. A sigma 1, 1 comma A1. On this object here, I turn this into a matrix. And now it's the matrix where I put these first two guys together as a row index. A1 sigma 2 comma sigma 3 to sigma L. So this is the reshaping. So now comes the SVD. 1. I will put the sum of the SVD right here. A sigma 1, 1 comma A1. Now I get U um, A1 sigma 2 comma A2 from the uh, singular value decomposition. S A2, A2 and V dagger A2 comma the entire rest. Okay, this is the SVD step. And now comes, and now I explain again um, how this uh, slicing works. Let me first write the stuff which stays unchanged. I will multiply this together right away to be C, um, A2, A3, C. How can this be? Sigma 
Uh, this is A2, sorry. Um, A2, A2. C A2, sigma 3, sigma 4 to sigma L. Okay, and now comes this step here, which is the slicing. Now I have a, a matrix U, which has the form, following form. Here I have um, A2 as the index which labels this here. And then I have the double index sigma um, A1 sigma 2. So and now I I'll do it in the following way. I set here sigma 2 is 1 down to sigma 2 is D. Say 1, 2, D. And then this is A1 equals 1 to A1 equals, this will here be actually D squared, but this is now not so important. So I split up sort of like the multi-index in this way. And then this object here is then A sigma 2 equals 1, A1 comma A2. This one here is A sigma 2 equals 2, A1, A2. And so I get this set of D matrices which replace this big one here. Okay, I hope. Uh, the dimension of A1 here happens to be D. Um, um, sorry, then I, yeah, very good. A2 is then D squared and so on and so forth. Thanks a lot. Um, good, but sort of like what we get here is now A sigma 2, a1, A2, okay? And now we are done, because what you can now do is, you can continue doing that as long as you wish. You can get then A1, I will not go through the last step, which again is a little bit special. A sigma 1, 1 comma A1, A sigma 2, A1, A2, until you are at sigma L minus 1, A L minus 2, A L minus 1, A sigma L, A L minus 1, comma 1. And this 1, 1 is really so that the product gives a scalar. And there, in fact, you see now where the dimensions come from, where I just made this little mistake. Um, this here is dimension D. This is D squared, and that will be D that will be d squared, so the powers grow towards the center. This simply comes from the dimensions that a singular value decomposition produces, which means at the center, if, if the system is large, the dim dimension will be exponentially large. So in principle, this is now the mathematical proof that you can decompose any state, but you could argue in some sense it's, it's useless because you are, you are back again to an exponentially large number of uh, coefficients and what do you do about it? Of course, the entire point will be about truncating it. But to close this off, of course, what we have here is now a bunch of matrix, matrix multiplications. So what we get is simply A sigma 1 to A sigma L as a product of matrices, and this is what we, um, what we started out from. And this is what I wanted to show um, at this point. So why did I go through that in so much detail? Looking at the clock, I get a little bit uh, nervous. Um, the point is that these techniques which we have, that you reshape matrices, vectors, sort of like by rearranging the indices between rows and columns. Um, this is a, te a technique which you use all the time. Then you use the SVD technique all the time. And then you use this slicing. And of course, you, what you can also do is g you give me these matrices. It may also be interesting to put them back together again to one big matrix. So basically, you, you unslice. Um, that is also an operation that one needs. But very clearly, 
apart from matrix, matrix multiplications, which pop up in this business here, obviously, all the time, that's all you need. So in some sense, I could say, well, until 3 o'clock, work out the following mathematical expressions, because there will not be much more in some sense. So now I want to uh, use this uh, to make the connection. Yeah? It, it, it just sorry, you know, guys, there is a ventilation, and it's so loud that I actually I have to come up to understand you. Um, no, these are the local states on on a lattice side. So sigma five for a spin would be either spin up or spin down. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me put that on the blackboard because it's interesting for everyone because we will be doing, for example, for electrons, for the typical Hubbard model situation, you would have the state zero, uh, empty, up, down, and double occupancy. So that would be, that would correspond to a case D equals four. And if you need multiple orbitals, well, um, you either divide them up, sort of like that you have uh, one side is split up into several orbitals. Um, that's actually what you should do. Um, you should not do, as a side remark, say make one fat side where you say I put um, sort of like all the orbitals of, a, of, an, of an atom um, on one side because then this D would, of course, become quite large. And it turns out that in all these algorithms, um, distrib length is not the problem, but local dimensions um, are rather a problem. So in doubt, divide it up if you can. We will see that in the case of probably tomorrow, uh, where I will have an example for spin ladders, where you can think about, do I make a rung into one big site, or do I really keep them separate and go zigzag or something? Then we will see, uh, see this point. OK. Any further questions at that stage? For bosons, by the way, you run into the problem that, of course, for bosons, your local lattice state will be n. And so the dimension formally uh, is, is infinite. Um, often, repulsive interactions save you because they suppress large occupancy. So you can say, I keep d to some d max say 10, if you know that basically you are done at five or six bosons, and then you, you check your calculation and vary this number a little bit, and then you see whether it works or not. If you have really extremely large um, occupation numbers as they can pop up in, uh, in, for example, in Polaron problems or so, there are techniques of compressing that. If anyone is interested in that, just drop me a come by or drop me an email or whatever. Because this is, this is, of course, one of the big constraints uh, that may be a problem. In these typical optical lattice Hamiltonians, it's not. Yeah. OK, let me, before the break, um, just finish off uh, this slide here about this, uh, the Schmidt decomposition. Because this is important to make the connection between this kind of very formal ansatz and something which is, um, which is very useful in the following. This goes back to 1910 or 11. Um, that I think about the, 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 the lattice, here, picture 1D, as a universe A, B, and I divide it into these subsystems A and B. And here they match. This is length L, and this has length L plus 1 to L. And so, of course, I can introduce local orthonormal basis on A and B. Then the most general state you can write down is, of course, this psi ij, where every state basically talks to every other one. And what you can do, of course, is you can say, oh, this is a matrix. Then I do a, sh a singular value decomposition on this matrix psi ij. Um, then uh, basically what I have is here are now the singular values. And the matrices u and v dagger, I hide in the sense that basically they are unitary or yeah, they are transformations. Maybe I have to extend them to be unitary. They are transformations on the original basis i and j. 
because of their properties, these states alpha, which I form, are still orthonormal sets, which I can extend to bases. And I have one set of alphas on sub subsystem A and one set of states on subsystem B, and they are orthonormal. Um, and so I have this beautiful representation of the state, which is the so-called Schmidt decomposition, if you haven't seen that. Um, before, and now instead of every state being connected to every other one, the states only talk to each other pairwise. And of course, they don't have to be the same because A and B can be totally different. But now you have reduced, you have brought the for a system into a form where states talk to each other pairwise. This will be extremely useful in a second, but you see the way to get it is the singular value decomposition. Okay, why do we need it? Let me get this one slide, but then it's promised uh, we stop for lunch. Um, as I said, entanglement is the big thing. Um, so what is entanglement, more precisely bipartite entanglement, um, which we understand well in the, these states? And the general way of measuring entanglement is you, you form the reduced density matrix of the system which is entangled with its environment. So this was my state. This is the density operator of the total state. I form the reduced density matrix by tracing out all the degrees of freedom of, of the environment. This could now be A and B or vice versa. And then the entanglement is simply given by the von Neumann entropy, the rho log rho, um, the, um, of the subsystem. So this is the entanglement. Uh, if you write it in terms of the eigenvalues of the, or the weights of the reduced density matrix, it takes this form. This is an expression which in one way or another you have seen, I think, very often. But now what does this impression imply for, the, for these matrix product states? Now, let's make an arbitrary bipartition. Say the dimension of the matrices which match here is M. I mean, they have to be the same in row and column so that I can multiply them together. So that means that because the product of all these guys spans basically the environment and of those guys spans the system, that the Schmidt decomposition, I don't really know what the values here are, uh, can have at most dimension M. Because row column of matrices, when you multiply them to each other, they talk to each other pairwise, just in, as in the Schmidt decomposition. So uh, the, our state, after being Schmidt decomposed, will have this form. The important point is not this here, but that it's at most m contributions. So the reduced density operator then, after tracing out, looks like this. And this is the um, entanglement. And now comes the point. What is the maximum value that this expression can take? Um, you can work out mathematically, maybe you know it by heart. The maximum is reached for a density matrix if all the weights are exactly the same. Where sort of like the information or, or the statistics is spread out as much as possible. Maximum entropy principle in some sense. And if you work that out, if this is M, then W alpha is one over M in that case, times M. And then here it's log one over m minus gives log m. So which means, and this is basically the take home message now for the first part of the lecture, that these, these kind of ansatz can at most encode an entanglement which is limited by the log of the matrix dimensions. And that will basically, in some sense, define what can be done with this kind of ansatz and what cannot be done with it. And that we will see at 3 o'clock and enjoy your lunch now. Thanks a lot. <laughs>